Pastor John, you're a compelling example to a lot of us uh, as a man who prays daily and prays corporately in, in his local church. So how do you structure your own prayer life? That's the question today from a listener, a pastor named Phil. Hello, Pastor John. I am a new pastor, and God has been teaching me a lot about prayer through good books by Tim Keller and Don Carson. My question for you is particularly, when you were serving as a senior pastor, how often during your day did you set aside time to deliberately focus on prayer? How often did you pray for the people of your church? Did you attempt to pray for everyone by name? Did you have a system to help you pray for everyone? Did you prioritize local leaders? I'm excited to participate in God's work through prayer, and I'm learning how important it is that I make it my first priority. But there are so many details that I have not figured out. Answering questions like this is always dangerous, because first, Jesus said to go into your closet and pray, uh, rather than standing on the corner and boasting how long you pray and how much you pray and how well you pray, because the praise of man is going to be your reward. You won't get anything from God. So answering a question like this could really put me in spiritual jeopardy. And secondly, it's dangerous because, and this is practically more important maybe for the listener to to grasp, because any glimpse into The life, like the biographical glimpse into my 33 years in the pastorate, is going to be, in a sense, misleading because uh, any season, even a long one, say 10 or 15 years, that I may describe doesn't really describe every other season. So I may say, I prayed like this, you know, between years 15 and 30. Well, it might have been a total wash in the first 15, or just the other way around. I might describe some nice five-year chunk where everything was going great, and the other 25 years were awful. So when you read read famous statements like Luther prayed for three hours, blah, 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 well, you know that's just one little tiny slice of his life that somebody wrote down. That's not every day in every season when his kids were every imaginable age. And so all that to say, take what I'm about to say with a very large (laughs) grain of salt. I will try to put to death my desire for your praise. And um, I will try to be conservative in my self-estimation of how much I prayed or how well I prayed during my pastoral ministry. I I would say like most pastors, I have never felt satisfied with my pattern or intensity of prayer, but um, you asked, and um, I will go ahead. The, the battle is just as strong at 71 as it's ever been. I need prayer as much now as I ever did, and so I, I speak from the season when I was a pastor, but don't want to give the impression that the battle is not still raging. Um, the pattern of prayer that I look back on with the greatest sense of satisfaction was a season, maybe, I don't know, 10, a little more, 10 years or so um, out of the 33. And it it was similar in other times, but this was a pretty repetitive pattern for a pretty long season. And it looked like this. Um, I have always prayed and read my Bible early in the morning by myself in a devotional, meditative way, turning the Bible into prayer as part of that time for my soul and for others, and then having a focused time on particular needs that I wanted to pray about. And I'll come back in a minute to say how I I did that. So there's always that, that the day begins with an hour with God alone in His Word so that I can face him with his spirit uh, surging in me. Then there were five prayer meetings every week that I attended with each lasting 30 minutes. Friday morning, 6.30 to 7. Tuesday morning, 6.30 to 7. Wednesday night, 5.30 5.30 before the evening events, Saturday evening, 30 minutes before the worship service, uh, Sunday morning, 8.15 before the worship service. So those are five 30-minute prayer meetings. And those meetings were attended by anywhere from 6 to 25 people, I would say. Rarely more, rarely less. 
there was no Bible teaching, no sharing of prayer requests. I really discourage sharing of prayer requests because they eat up all the time to pray. We, we took 30 seconds or a minute to read a short passage of scripture, and then we went straight to prayer. And when 30 minutes was up, I closed or somebody closed in prayer, and we went about our way. It's amazing how long a prayer meeting can endure in the life of a church if you start it and stop it on time and only pray instead of talking and talking and talking about prayer. Uh, that prayer, by the way, on Friday morning, I still go to, and it's been going since 1988. I've scarcely missed a Friday morning prayer meeting except when I'm out of town for those, whatever is that, 30, 40 years. I can't remember how long that is. Um, in addition to these formal prayer meetings, the weekly staff meeting always began not just with, with a prayer, but a season of praying for each other in the church. I really encourage pastors to lead meetings this way. Don't open in prayer. Open in a season of prayer. Let it be a lingering season. I mean, it, it may only be 15 minutes, but to, to, to just open in prayer and then charge into your business doesn't say the right thing about where your trust is. I remember one time a man, I failed to do this, and at, I was just dismissing, a, 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 we called it a deacon's meeting back then, um, of about 12 guys, and he said, can I just share something? And he broke down in tears and said his dog had died that afternoon. I mean, can you believe this? He wanted to tell everybody his dog had died, and he was crying. And I thought to myself when I got home, why didn't I open in a season of prayer and say, anything urgent going on in your lives? we got to do business here, but anything urgent? Um... Every January, every January, we had a week of prayer with, with all night prayer meeting on Friday night, uh, and prayer meetings every day, morning and noon. I went to all those during that week of prayer. Um, besides all that, uh, I tried to pray without ceasing, which simply means as often as I could remember over and over again during the day, roll my burdens onto the Lord, ask for his help before every meeting, before every conversation, before every phone call. Just the air you breathe is help, help. I trust you and call some promise to mind. Um, in answer to the question, um, whether I prayed for all the people in the church by name, the answer is no, I never did that. Um, there were 700 members when I came to the church, even if there are only 350 people in attendance. <clears throat> and I, I never made that effort. It seemed to me it would become so mechanical, rushing through those names however long it took. So I, I didn't do that. Maybe I was wrong in that. Uh, one thing Noel and I did do for 20 years is once a year we would invite people to our house called Missions in the Manse, uh, having to do with world missions. And I enticed people on Sunday by saying, if you come and you're interested in pursuing missions, if you come, Noel and I will put your name on a list and pray for you by name every day for the rest of the year. And we did that for 20 years, which means we were pretty much praying all the time for these people. And sometimes there were 60, sometimes there were 100 people on this list. We read them out loud to the Lord on our knees at the bed at night and prayed for them as a group. Um, if you wonder how I decide to pray during that morning hour, the answer is I prayed in concentric circles. I still do this to, to this day. The most needy person I know is John Piper, and so I pray for John Piper's soul, because if I, if I lose the faith, I, I can't pray for anybody. And then I, I widen my circle to my family, and then I widen the circle to staff and, and elders at church. Today, it's, it's, it's different up here for Desiring God and the faculty over at Bethlehem College and Seminary. And at this point, um, back in the pastoral days, I was still praying for people by name. So the elders by name and the staff by name. Um, after that came our missionaries and the church as a whole, all the members, then our ministries, and then um, the city, and then unreached peoples, and so on. You get the idea what concentric circles 
means. And and we all know that on any given day, you may be so clobbered and overwhelmed by some desperate need in your family or in your church or in your city that that need consumes virtually all the time. So I'm not presenting any idealized picture of this happening without exception every day, just usually. Uh, I think one of the most practical things I could suggest to pastors is is that, and really to anybody, every year or so, a pastor should read a book on prayer. Uh, not so much a technical, exegetical, apologetic book, but a book relating um, to the experiences of great men and women of prayer, telling their stories. We need models to show us what is possible and beautiful, because most of us probably are living at a level far below what we could be living in power if we were inspired by those who were ahead of us spiritually year after year. I was inspired by such books. In fact, when I wrote the book, Brothers, We Are Not Professionals, that whole book was based on a series of articles, and that whole series of articles was inspired by reading E.M. Bounds' Power Through Prayer, my first year in the pastoral ministry. It set me on an amazing course that I will give thanks to God for all my days. Whatever you do, um, don't let go of the life of prayer. Seek to deepen it and saturate it with the Word of God. Don't assume that you... Uh, just heard f- from me the best model. Com- compared to some church patterns in the world, my pattern is pitiful. It's just pitiful. And compared to others, it, it was significant. But don't assume it was ideal. Seek the Lord. He may have something very different and better for you. The church and the world. This is the, this is one of the reasons I'm so passionate about pressing the prayer life into pastors. Um, The church and the world do not need more efficient, psychologically savvy, culturally informed, managerially skilled executives in the pastorate. We don't need any more of that. What the church needs, what the world needs to taste is men in whose presence Christ has been men of God, men of God, who have the savor of life to life and death to death because they've been in the presence of the aroma of Christ. Amen. What a great uh, commission and a charge to pastors and really to all of us. So on behalf of thousands of listeners who have been motivated by your example and by your words uh, today, thank you, Pastor John, for for going into this detail uh, into your own private uh, prayer life. And thank you for listening to the podcast and making it a part of your day three times a week. We publish and you can subscribe to our audio feeds and search our past episodes in our archive. Even reach us by email with a question of your own, even questions as they relate to your devotional life and how to best structure it. You can do all that through our online home at desiringgod.org forward slash Ask Pastor John. Well, we return on Friday to talk about the book of Hebrews chapter 6. Does this chapter suggest that we can attain to an ideal mark of doctrinal maturity in the Christian life that once we've gotten settled on the basics of Christ's life and his work, his death and his resurrection, and the future of his return, once we, once we understand those things, then we move on from those foundational doctrines, leave them behind, and don't return to them to rethink them over and over through the years. In other words, is there something fundamentally wrong with the cross-centered life? It's a good question on a perplexing text. Until then, I'm your host, Tony Ranke, and we will see you on Friday.